Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and thank you very much for attending. Um, and thank you very much for the kind introduction there. Um, we are all taxpayers, and we are not willing partners in this. So somewhere we are forced to, to take part in this uh, paying of tax. But in the process, you must be treated fairly. Doesn't mean that the fact that you have to pay this money, you must be abused in any way, uh, shape or form. And that's why for us, the Office of the Tax Ombud is very, very critical that taxpayers are treated fairly. When you have a tax community that is treated fairly, even compliance becomes slightly easy. You know, paying tax is more like going to a dentist. We don't, we don't like it, but all the same. But we are there maybe as an anesthetic so that you don't feel the pain. Uh, so whenever the dentist doesn't administer us, then you can cry. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we can assist. Now, why was this office established? I mean, I can talk about all these things, but why was this office established? It is so that you can be protected against SARS, and SARS can actually even look at uh, respecting your rights. Um, so, so that we can also mediate between you and the tax man uh, in instances where you really need our services. So, that Cats Commission back in the 1990s thought it, there's, it's, there's a necessity to have an office like this. Uh, so they made that proposal then, um, which only, you know, which proposal was effected only in 2013 when the office was established. So I'll just say a few things about this office so that at least you know what it's all about. So what we're calling for all the time is just for SARS to be accountable, to be accountable to you as a taxpayer, to be transparent in their dealings with you. So whatever decision that they make, uh, they must be able to say to you, these are the decisions, not making decisions behind the corners and without explaining to you what the, those decisions are. So we're also making sure that uh, you are treated fairly in the process. Um, you know, I'll give you, an, you know, just a few examples of where we actually said you did not treat this taxpayer fairly. You need to reverse. You need to go back and redo uh, your processes, and which is something that you know we are doing all the time. So, f most importantly, it's you know you need to have a credible institution. Let's look at us as an institution, the tax ombud. We need to be credible. We need to be trusted. And not only us, but SARS as well need to be trusted. And uh, for us, we need to be trusted as a good stakeholder that is independent for that matter, and uh, as somebody who, I mean, that as an office that is impartial in its dealings with uh, the revenue authority and yourself. Uh, we have to demonstrate that impartiality and fairness. So wherever you feel that you know, we don't seem to be independent, we don't seem to be impartial, you, you can point out and tell us we are not uh, playing our role. So any institution that is like an ombud institution, it needs to be credible. If it's not credible, well, you may as well close the doors and let everyone go. So one of the key things uh, as we operate, as we deal with SARS, we have to make certain recommendations. Although our recommendations may not necessarily be binding, which is maybe a shortcoming, uh, which we actually had to address, there is an obligation on the part of SARS to give reasons if it does not implement our obligations, which is much better. Initially, you, they had no reason to, you know, there was no obligation on their part to give reasons when, whenever they disagree with us. So what we did was to propose a, a legislative amendment that at least there must be an obligation for them to, to respond to our recommendations. They may not be binding still per se, 
but we have so much power that, you know, the power that we have is really in publishing what they, what they refuse to implement, that which they refuse to implement. So if we make a recommendation to SARS and they refuse to implement, we make it public. So you, as a taxpayer, can also even call them to account. You can question them. You, as a... You know, the parliament can also question them, can call them on board and say, well, well how come you did not implement the recommendations of the tax ombudsman? So that's, those are some of the things that we had to build in, into, some, uh, uh, into um, uh, in the legislation, just to make sure that there is accountability on their part. So some people really always like frustrating people and not expect them to complain or discourage them from complaining. We are encouraging you to complain. Not only that, but you know, when your complaints are a very good source of feedback. So you can't sit back and say, well, you know, I mean, this is SARS and the like. You are entitled to ask reasons for reasons, for any decision that is made by SARS, for any action that is taken by SARS. SARS is supposed to hear you. They're supposed to give you a hearing. So, so, in, in a nutshell, uh, let me just tell you about the office uh, slightly, what its mandate is. Our mandate is to look at any complaint by a taxpayer. So it doesn't matter who the taxpayer is. It can be an individual, an ordinary man in the street. It can be a, a trust. It can be a company. It can be a small company. It can be a multi-list, uh, you know, a, a multinational it doesn't matter. As long as it's a taxpayer, they can approach us. But what, for what kind of complaint? It must be a complaint that has to do with the service. It must be a complaint that has to do with procedure or administrative issues. But let me explain briefly what that is. Service is when you write to SARS, you say, well, I need the reasons for X, Y, Z. Please give me those reasons. You received an assessment, you don't understand what it's all about. You write to them, you say, well, please give me reasons for this assessment. They are obliged by law to give you reasons for those assessments. If they do not, and you still complain and they do not, you can complain to the Office of the Tax Ombud. So we can deal with them in that respect. In terms of procedure, I can give you an example. SARS, before they take your money from the bank, uh, if you owe them, they have to say, follow certain procedures before they do that. So if they don't follow those procedures to, um, as set out in the legislation, uh, we can say to them, please go back, return the money, start afresh, follow the right procedure, and then you can take the money. It doesn't matter whether you owe them or not. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we are there to make sure that they follow the right procedures. So, for example, when they take that money, they need to write a letter first of demand to say, this is how much you owe, this is when you need to pay, and these are the consequences if you don't pay, these are your options. You can ask for deferred payment, you can ask for a compromise, or you can settle, and the like. So, you, 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 that letter must be very specific. It states, spells out exactly all those things. If it's not, and the money is taken, and you complain to us, we write a letter to SARS and say, you did not follow this procedure, return the money. It doesn't matter whether it was taken in 2016 or 2015 or whenever, but as long as they did not comply with that requirement, we make a recommendation, which obviously, because the Act says they have to do such things, they have to implement such recommendations. So, a service is procedure, it's administrative issues. You make representation to SARS. You say, well, uh, please, I request you to, to suspend the pay now and argue later. I've received this. I want to object, but I don't want you to collect my money in the meantime. So I request you to, to suspend the debt in the meantime uh, until such time as the dispute has been resolved. And then you can start enforcing the debt. You are perfectly entitled to do that. SARS is supposed to 
not ignore. It's not supposed to ignore your request. It's supposed to apply its mind quickly, come back to you and say yes, or if it says no, then it means that it can start collecting, but not before the end of 10 days after they've given you that decision. So those are some of the things that you need to be aware of. So if they ever collect from you without responding to your request for suspension and you complain to us, we'll simply instruct them to say, well, look, you cannot collect until till such time as you have given an, a response to, um, to, to the request. So that is our mandate. Anything that, in fact, anything that has to do with the uh, the acts that are administered by the commissioner, be it Income Tax Act, the Tax Administration Act, um, the VET Act, uh, Skills Development Levy, all those acts that are administered by the, co the, the commissioner. If you have a complaint on how they dealt with you in relation to those, we can be able to assist you, as, as, ex especially, and in fact, only if it relates to service, procedure, and administrative uh, aspects. Now, also, one of our uh, key mandates is to review systemic issues. So, if any issue that is coming up that may have an impact on many taxpayers, we call it a, a, a systemic issue. So, if there is such an issue, we, we can step in and investigate. For example, delays in the payment of refunds, which is one of the things that we had to do uh, in the recent times. SARS was withholding refunds. In, in some instances, for no reason at all. In some instances, only because they say, well, you have not updated. So the legislation saw it fit that there are circumstances where this will cause undue hardship to you. If you have a refund, the sheriff is sitting outside, says, look, I'm attaching now, or I'm writing up your assets, and you're waiting for a refund from SARS, and they say, no, in 10 days, if you haven't paid, we're coming to collect the assets. Can you wait for 21 days? Can you wait for 42 days? So the legislation deemed it fit to make exceptions to that. Where it's going to cause undue hardship, you can directly go to the tax ombud and say, this is my situation, this is the troubles I'm facing, let me just uh, you know, lodge a complaint with you. You can do so. Now also, if we see that maybe you're raising a systemic issue, systemic issues, I've already de defined them as any issue that has a potential to affect uh, ta many taxpayers and negatively. If you have a systemic issue, you come directly to us. You don't have to exhaust the SARS internal processes. Also, the legislation gives us a discretion to actually see how long it will take, what, whether the time would be reasonable to, ex it will be reasonable to ex expect of you to exhaust the SARS internal processes. If the time it will take, it will not be reasonable, we have a discretion, we can accept your complaint uh, directly. So, but in a nutshell, I may not cover everything, you know, um, in this, but typical complaints we receive. I mentioned delays in the payment of refunds. Uh, that has been amongst the top three complaints that we receive in the office. Because, you know, some people even had the perception that, you know, SARS is sometimes when it sees that it's towards the end of the financial year, it doesn't release refunds so that it can actually be seen to have performed very well. So, the, you know, the suspicion went on just like that. So we had to conduct this review and look at exactly what were the issues. The first one was like, you know, SARS would play stoppers, you know, just for individuals, it will stop the refund saying, well, you must go to a, a SARS branch and where you can update your banking details. And then, it doesn't matter where you are. If you are in, in the Northern Cape, where maybe sometimes the closest branch 
is 200 kilometers away. It means you must get into the car. If you are working, it means that you must take a day's leave and go and stand in the queue, hoping to be served, and you are not able to be served maybe that day, and they're telling you to come back the next day, that kind of thing. So you update your banking details. You've never changed your banking details in the first place, but now you are suddenly called to update your banking details. And, and we found that some of the requests were very unreasonable. And we found that even after some people have complied with that request, they will still wait a month, two months, three months, even four, four months without receiving their refunds. So we said, no, 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 it can. And some people, when some officials within SARS, when they are asked, you know, um, but I've complied with all your requirements, you know, why is it? He says, no, there's no turnaround for stoppers. So there's no turnaround time for, you, for us to do our work. So, I mean, how arrogant can that be? You have the right to be treated fairly. So we had to say to SARS, look, you have only, you need to set the time frames uh, within which you release those refunds, where people have complied with your request. So they made an undertaking that you know, it would take maybe even up to five days to release the refund. Sometimes you file a return, they, they verify that you have a refund and you would not be paid because they realize there is a new return that has come in. So in anticipation that there may be a debt in the new return, so they can simply set off against your refund, they withhold your verified refund. Who said you cannot do that? No, there's nothing in the law that permits you to do that. So they had to stop that practice. If you far come across something like that, you can report it directly to us with Office of the Tax Ombud. Refunds of one period being withheld simply because they are auditing another year. We, there was somebody submitted a, a, a return for 2016. They realized there's a refund. But then the 2017 was due, it was submitted. They said, no, while we are auditing this one, we won't release the one that we verified. So that is also not uh, proper. The law does not permit SARS to do that. Um, and then the, the other one, which was much more serious uh, to us, in our view, was when they were raising assessments to simply set off the refund with no basis at all. So uh, they will look at how much refund is due to you. It may be 121,111 rands and 15 cents. This, this, instead of paying you that refund, they go and work out and issue an assessment equivalent to that refund which was like 121, 115 and whatever cents, up to the last cent, just so that it can, the refund can be wiped off and then you no longer are owed anything. But it will do so without giving you reasons. You have the right to be treated fairly, remember. You have the right to be given reasons for any assessment that SARS issues. You can ask for those reasons. Sometimes it is, in fact, it's obliged by law to even communicate even before you ask. So SARS will simply pass those journals. Now, I may put it mildly, but if I'm to be blunt, that kind of conduct, it really amounts to really stealing from you as a taxpayer. If there's no justification for that assessment, it amounts to stealing from the taxpayer. So we said to SARS, you cannot do that. It must stop. So they undertook, they stopped the practice. So that came out of some of the things that we really did, you know, out of the refund report. I just gave you a, a few just as an illustration. Sometimes you make a payment. It's, in, it's allocated incorrectly. So it goes into an account, not yours, or it goes into suspense. So it doesn't clear your debt. Guess what? SARS will still want to collect from you. Again, so it may collect twice. Now, as it happened in one case where the taxpayer had paid 552,000 rand, and then 
taxpayers went and collected 552,000 rand from the taxpayer's bank account. So how much is SARS having? Over a million, 1.1 million from a taxpayer. So the taxpayer says, but what's happening? You know, I paid you, and please pay me the money back. And SARS says, no, um, give us proof that you paid. Uh, show us proof, show us this, give us this, it went on for almost two years. And until we stepped in, the person complained and we looked at it, we said, but how can you do that? In the meantime, SARS had passed a, 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 an, a journal to clear that credit. So we had to ask for questions and, that, and like, and guess what? That refund was paid, but incidentally, it was paid around the 5th of April. What is the significance of that? Okay, you may, you may make your own conclusions. <laughs> so those are some of the things, although we may not say they deliberately, but there are certain actions that make us to resist the temptation to make that conclusion. So in correct allocation of payments can be problematic. And, and this is sometimes what happens. They're in, and, and, uh, and they keep bothering you, taking money from you. And delays in the issuing of taxpayer, uh, tax clearance certificates. Now, this one is linked also to, I mean, I may link it to the fact that generals get passed when, when the PAYE statement of account. Can you imagine you are applied for a clearance certificate or you're checking your compliance status, you know everything has been perfect and suddenly, there's a debt, which you don't know where it comes from. So it will affect your compliance status. Now, one of the issues that we had to say, raise, is that VET, you submit a return on the 25th of the month, and you are expected to pay by the end of that month. So between the 25th and the end of the month, if you were in a paying position, the system that taxpayer complaint status would reflect as non-compliant. But by law, you are not required to pay before the, the 25th, before the 31st of, or the 30th or the end of the, the last day of the month. So we have to say you need to adjust your system in such a way that uh, it caters for this, uh, uh, this issue. Now the problem there is that you know you yourself to be compliant and you may be tendering for, a, for, for some work and then the person, the people who are checking that, they realize that you, know, you, you, you are not compliant and they make a decision based on that. And in some instances, there are people who were, would owe one rent and uh, you know, SARS will not pursue you for one rent and you know, they would not regard you, should not regard you as non-compliant for one rand. So, but the system was actually reflecting as non-compliant. Uh, so which was devastating for, for other people. Imagine you cannot even receive payment because your tax, tax compliance status shows as red, non-compliant. So those are some of the issues that uh, we sometimes have to deal with. Now, I was saying non-adherence to uh, uh, timelines to dispute resolution, uh, time frames, time frames in re relation to dispute uh, resolution. SARS expects you to oblige, to, to, to comply with those timelines, but it doesn't comply itself. Re failing to re respond to requests uh, from taxpayer, requests for reasons. The classic one was when a taxpayer says, I'd, please explain to me the rationale or reasons for this assessment. And, and the official on the other side said, look, you know what, if actually, you, actually if you don't agree, you must just object. But how do I object if I don't even know how you arrived at the, the conclusion, you know, at how you made an assessment? So those kind of things, um, those are things that we sometimes deal with. It's not to paint us in a bad light, but unfortunately we deal with complaints and the, such complaints come. Uh, IRP5 errors, 
if you are an employee, you receive an IRP5, you expect SARS to be having the same kind of IRP5. And then if you go to SARS, you submit and say, no, no, there's something wrong with the IRP5 certificate, go back to the employer. You go to the employer, the employer says to you, you know, but, you know, we are not in good terms with you. Go back to SARS. So you go, it's a ping pong, ping pong, you cannot have that, you know. So we had to say to SARS, SARS, please use your own legislation to force the employer to comply and to correct these things. And then uh, revision of assessments without reasons was one of the issues, uh, profile hijacking, um, you know, protect your stuff, protect your, your documents. Somebody lays their hands on your documents and they uh, do something with your documents and generate a refund, guess what? SARS may pursue you, not the perpetrator. But there are the ways and means to deal with that. You may have to go and open a case at a police station and show that my identity was stolen or everything, and, uh, and then they give you a case number, then you can, we have been helping several taxpayers in that regard. And SARS will actually um, look, clear the debt, and go after the, the perpetrator if, if the perpetrator is found. Final letters of demand, I mentioned that, what they, uh, they have to comply with when they deal with you as a taxpayer. So, well, this is an institution, maybe I must just go back and talk about the institution. I mean, the tax ombud himself is Judge Bennett Mwepe. It was established in 2013, uh, so it was officially launched in 2014. Uh, and, you know, it's built from scratch, from absolutely nothing to what it is now. I'm sure you've seen some pamphlets, complaints guide, complaints form uh, distributed amongst uh, all of you. But that's a work that has been taking place from about 2014 until now. We've had a couple of successes in terms of uh, legislative amendments. Issue that we have currently issues is issues of independence. We must be structurally and every, in every respect be independent. Currently, okay, in the, previously we had to appoint staff in terms of the SARS Act and have them seconded to SARS in consultation with the commissioner, meaning that the commissioner could, uh, could influence who gets appointed uh, in an office that has to scrutinize him. So we said, no, 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 we can't do that. It, there must not be this consultation story. Uh, legislation was amended. Uh, so we don't have to consult with the commissioner whenever we make an appointment. And then the other issue that we had to deal with was the funding. The, the, the drafters of the then legislation said the funding shall come out of SARS, and we said, no, 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 <laughs> it should not be. Uh, you know the temptation can be to s tighten the, s the wallet whenever the heat is, you know, on us, and then so that it can be rendered uh, uh, dysfunctional. So, but overall, we are, we had to change that, and the minister determines the budget now. But there are still, these are some of the issues that we're trying to, to work on, to just make sure that it's a perfect model, it's a perfect office that is not compromised in any way. So we want an institutional independent. We are working on that process so that it can be an entity on its own uh, and, and can have its own enabling legislation. For people who are in the legal, with a legal background may understand that. We need to have a legal capacity, not just something that looks like a unit, uh, a cost center within SARS. Um, so we're looking at presence all over the show, so we're not servicing our offices are in Pretoria. So we also need to regularly ask you questions, how are we treating you as taxpayer to monitor our effectiveness. We can do uh, surveys and the like. And those who used our offices, we also want to feedback from them. And then we had to push SARS to issue a service charter because we know the service charter is a yardstick that we can use to make sure that SARS is complying. Uh, it's, it's really treating you fairly and in every respect. We would want to look at taxpayer bill of rights. 
Well, currently, right now, we don't have taxpayer bill of rights. It is a debate whether we should have or we shouldn't have, um, but there should be. And uh, the Davis Committee, in their recommendations, say there must be um, a there must be a taxpayer bill of rights. They made such recommendations. The time may be short and my time is up. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Advocate Eric Mkowani.